This is Epicenter, episode 376 with guest Aaron Wright. Hi, I'm Sebastian Couture, and you're listening to Epicenter, the podcast where we interview crypto founders, builders, and thought leaders. On this show, we dive deep to learn how things work at a technical level, and we fly high to understand visionary concepts and long-term trends. If you like Epicenter, the best way to support us is to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. If you're on a Mac or iOS device, the easiest way to do that is to go to epicenter.rocks slash Apple. And if you're new to the podcast, be sure to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Today, our guest is Aaron Wright. He's a professor at the Cardozo School of Law. He's the co-founder of Open Law, and he's an expert on the legal treatment of DAOs. In fact, he co-authored a book called Blockchain and the Law with Primavera Di Filippi. I believe it was last year that that book came out. So last year, he participated in the launch of the LAO, the LAO. It's a DAO that is organized as a legal entity. It's an LLC in Delaware, and it's backed about 30 projects in the Ethereum ecosystem since it came into existence. So we had a really interesting conversation about DAOs and how they're treated in existing legal frameworks, although we mostly focused on the US. We talked at length about the legal status of DAOs in Wyoming. There's some really interesting developments going on there, as I'm sure you're probably aware. Uh, Prior to this conversation, I had only like a limited understanding of what Wyoming is doing in this space, but it's really cool actually that they're making it possible for a DAO to be registered and recognized by law and that they have the frameworks also to kind of simplify this registration process. I think it's like a very good sign for the ecosystem. We also spent some time uh, discussing the different types of DAOs that exist and the different applications that exist in this ecosystem. And we speculated about the types of exciting applications that could emerge in the future. I mean, personally, I think DAOs are just one of the most interesting things in the space. And one of my first encounters with this concept, the concept of an autonomous organization, was this pretty famous Mike Hearn talk from 2013 at the Turing Festival. At least it's it's famous in my mind because it really inspired me. And it it was the thing I think that really made me want to get into uh, the crypto space back in in 2014 or wherever it was when I got into it. And uh, he describes this autonomous organization that runs a a fleet of self-driving cars and it's like super far out and futuristic. Um, So if you you haven't seen this talk, if you're new to crypto and perhaps don't know about this talk or perhaps don't even know who Mike Hearn is, uh, you should check it out. The link is in the show notes. Of course, DAOs have come a long way since those early concepts and most DAOs now have governance tokens. And well, you know where you can easily trade governance tokens? On one inch. It's my go-to DEX aggregator, and I know that when I use 1inch, I'm getting the best price for my trade across all DEXs and AMMs. To start using 1inch, go to epicenter.rocks slash 1inch. And with that, here's our conversation with Aaron Wright. Welcome to Epicenter. We're here with Aaron Wright today. Aaron, um, you are the co-founder of OpenLaw and one of the founders of the Lao and basically a thought leader in the DAO space and the legal blockchain space in general. It's a pleasure to actually have you on. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about your background? Yeah, absolutely. And um, thanks so much for having me on. As uh, I noted uh, before, I've been a longtime listener, so it's uh, great to, to, to be able to, to join the podcast. My background uh, is a bit interesting. I have a background in law and, and, and technology. Uh, I'm a professor at Cardozo Law School in New York. Um, before joining Cardozo's faculty, I uh, started a company and sold it to the for-profit sister project to Wikipedia. So I spent quite a bit of time in the Wikipedia ecosystem. Um, I have uh, been deeply involved in the blockchain ecosystem uh, since about 2011, when I started falling down the Bitcoin rabbit hole. Um, I had the pleasure um, of uh, playing a small role to help launch Ethereum and work through some of the issues there. Uh, I've also had the pleasure of working with lots of other great folks in uh, in the ecosystem. Uh, I co-authored a book with Prima Verity Filippi on blockchain law and policy. Um, I was able to help out a number of great projects um, when they were starting or, or early on, uh, including uh, working with uh, Joe Lubin at Consensus, uh, working with some of the folks on the Chainlink team, also working um, with, with folks um, on other other great teams over the years. 
uh, from my research with Primavera um, and thinking about uh, kind of this emerging blockchain ecosystem, uh, I've been able to help build and co-found a project called OpenLaw, uh, which is uh, thinking about what I view is, is the third leg of kind of the commercial revolution that we're building. Uh, we have Bitcoin um, as kind of a uh, first e-currency. Uh, Ethereum obviously is an axiomatic smart contracting platform. Uh, and the last leg and kind of the cypherpunk dream has always been a Ricardian contracting system, um, which is this idea of linking together traditional legal agreements, digitizing them, cryptographically securing them, um, and hopefully uh, providing a sort of interface for the traditional world or meat space world that, um, that I think we still inhabit. Uh, so that's been a, a really great, a great opportunity uh, to work with so many great teams and obviously build some uh, hopefully important technology uh, and kind of related to that, and we've been applying some of the tools we developed on OpenLaw uh, to start building out uh, a network of DAOs. Um, the first DAO that, that we launched was the, the Lao, um, which I'm sure we'll get into. We've also uh, launched another DAO called Flamingo DAO, which is more NFT uh, focused. And we have about three or four more that I think you'll see over the next couple of weeks and months uh, that, are, that are in the hopper. Super cool. So you've been in the ecosystem a very long time. So you you were here when the the DAO, the the entire the DAO thing went down. Were were you interested in DAOs before that, or did that kind of kick it off for you? Yeah, I mean, I I actually was an avid reader of Bitcoin Magazine uh, way back in the day, and I remember uh, Dan Larimer writing about decentralized autonomous corporations, which was kind of the precursor to DAOs. Uh, I thought that that was a fascinating concept. And so the thought being that you could use at that time, the Bitcoin blockchain and an interesting implementation called Color Coins uh, to begin to represent the organizational structure of a corporation. Uh, so using a blockchain to kind of record interests in the entity, uh, using those interests to, to think about how to transfer uh, assets, uh, how to build uh, controls uh, into a corporation using smart contracts. I thought it was absolutely fascinating and kind of all clicked together. Uh, so not surprising when, when Vitalik uh, and, and others began to you know, venture towards Ethereum, and DAOs became an important part of that story. Right, uh, DAOs appear in the white paper. There was lots of conversations around DAOs that the Ethereum community uh, began to think about. Uh, I was equally fascinated. Um, and the DAO itself was really the first expression of that interest, right? Uh, so Ethereum uh, was just recently launched uh, for the most part, even though it took some time to, to get beyond test nets and a whole bunch of other uh, technical hurdles. Uh, but, you know, I really thought it was great that Christoph and, and team uh, began to really push here. Uh, they wanted to build uh, what was in the white paper. They wanted to explore what these new digital organizations could look like. Uh, and the DAO was really the first great experiment um, in that area. I remember even before the DAO launched, um, you know, seeing certain demos and other things by the Slocka team dealing with, you know, Ethereum slash IoT related devices, which I thought were incredibly cool. Um, and I think to everybody's surprise, though, the DAO just was much more successful than I than I think anybody would have imagined. Right? Uh, it was supposed to be kind of a a small experiment. It became a massive experiment, uh, and then it had a kind of a spectacular finish. Uh, which I think was uh, was great in terms of animating people's minds about the possibilities of Ethereum, uh, but at the same time highlighting a number of the challenges and pitfalls, both technical and then over the subsequent months uh, as you know, lawyers and other folks began to dig in, some regulatory challenges as well. Uh, so, uh, it, you know, I think it was a, the first great use case for Ethereum was DAOs. Uh, and I do think people had a bit of PTS DAO after... Uh, the DAO, and they were kind of afraid to to play around and dive in and, and start to start to see what this ecosystem could look like. There was obviously developer teams like the Aragon team and the DAOSX team that were that were pushing forward, but uh, I think people put it to to the side. Uh, you know, as we saw token sales and other uh, other kind of crypto economic systems begin to be explored in you know 2016, 17, and 18. Uh, but they're back, right? DAOs are coming back into to focus. Uh, there's a, a lot of activity in the DAO space that I think, as you know, folks are beginning to pay attention to. And if you are a developer or are somebody that's interested in blockchain technology, I imagine that it's probably worth your time to start to dig in here uh, and think about what may be coming over the next couple months and years. 
Yeah, it would certainly come a long way. I mean, when when you talk about like colored coins and and these things back in back in the early days, it, like it really takes me down memory lane, right? Like, and and also I think I was also very kind of marvelled at the at this idea that you know things, uh, objects, uh, and and also you know more ephemeral things like like corporations could be managed by some sort of an autonomous organization. And if you remember in the beginning, and you you kind of alluded to this. Is, a lot of the interest in DAOs was coming from this idea of managing devices, like physical devices. So Slocket was one uh, example of this. But even before that, uh, it was Mike Hearn who had given this really interesting talk about autonomous agents and you know how you could basically have like a car drive itself and be its own autonomous economic agent. A lot of the interest back then seemed to be coming from this place of wanting to govern physical objects or having DAOs govern physical objects. But it turns out that what, what's, what the primary use case has been to govern uh, software projects, govern uh, things like investment funds and things like that. Where do you think the initial, the initial vision for DAOs perhaps was wrong? Or why do you think that this IoT vision of a DAO didn't quite come to fruition and rather we were governing things like software and uh, and investment vehicles. What, where, where was the disconnect there in your view? Yeah, I don't know if there was a disconnect, right? I think we're, I think it's both, right? I think we're going to see DAOs um, manage um, human endeavors, right? Uh, people getting together and wanting to do something more productive, um, you know, and hopefully beneficial to society. And I think at the same time, and that Mike Hearn talk, uh, I think that was at a, a London meetup or, or something along those lines. It's fantastic if you haven't taken a look at it. I, th I think you should. Um, it's definitely worth your time. Um, I think that that's the end point, right? And so DAOs will operate on a spectrum from helping to coordinate human activity and over time, as the technology matures, also increasingly coordinate uh, machine-related activity as well. Um, and then the notion is, is that these software-based systems uh, are natural fits to create efficiencies when it comes to coordinating human activity. And at the same time, due to their decentralized and autonomous and automatic nature, are also going to be useful for coordinating uh, machines. Um, I don't think we're, we're there yet. I don't think the IoT ecosystem is necessarily there yet, although we obviously see lots of continued growth there. Uh, I don't think the scalability of uh, Ethereum or other blockchain-based systems is there quite yet. Um, and trust, because once you're managing a device, particularly something like an automobile, which can hurt people, you're going to want really uh, strong security guarantees. Um, and I think that the last piece is this, you know, kind of real world to crypto or real world to smart contract divide. I don't know if anybody has firmly tackled that yet, right? Like the Slocket folks were playing around with some early examples with that. Um, and I don't, I haven't seen as much interest in that yet. Uh, my sense is when we get to blockchain 2.0 or blockchain 3.0, which I think we're we're kind of meandering uh, towards, um, folks will begin to pick up those technical challenges again. But you know, at a high level, I think DAOs are a very very big umbrella and tent. Uh, they're going to uh, you know govern both the coordination of people and the coordination of machines, um, and I think we're just really taking the first steps in that direction. Uh, after you know taking some steps, getting knocked down, and, and now we're dusting ourselves off as an ecosystem and, and kind of pushing forward. Mm, yeah, I think for the, for the physical objects, I think liability is probably one of the biggest challenges to get past. And y there are some practical examples of this. Like if you look at, say, what are the, like those, you know, the scooters that you see all over, like major cities, I think have probably some similar you know, legal challenges around liability and like even... I mean, I know that, uh, for example, uh, uh, here in France, there was a question about uh, who's responsible if those if they're damaged, right? Like, uh, are, can you hold someone accountable for damaging one of those scooters if, in fact, I mean, they're owned by a company, but um, they're sort of in the public space? So there are probably quite a few uh, legal questions around that. Yeah, a thousand percent, right? So questions when it comes to machines is who's responsible if some, somebody gets hurt. Um, and in many ways, it's, it's not that dissimilar with more autonomous organizations. So um, one way to think about DAOs is to break them down into subcategories. One would be uh, more of a decentralized organization, so one where humans are really in charge. Uh, the second one, which I'd consider to be the pure DAO, is where the algorithm kind of sits in the, the center. Uh, so if that algorithm is coordinating activity, is that responsible? Uh, if it's coordinating you know, physical objects, 
Uh, should the algorithm itself be responsible or should the manufacturer be responsible? You know, these are kind of meta questions uh, that I think um, uh, policy folks that are looking into technology are grappling with and will grapple with it in the blockchain context, but also as it comes to you know, other forms of autonomous devices, right? Like an autonomous car or self-driving car being the kind of first, I think, major example there. But we'll sort, we'll, we'll sort through it. I think there's some, some folks that are thinking about where that liability should attach, and humans tend to find somebody responsible for something if, if people get hurt or something goes wrong. One Inch is a decentralized exchange aggregator that sources liquidity from the top DEXs and AMMs to save you money and time on swaps. One Inch finds the best possible trading paths across over 20 supported liquidity protocols and splits them up across multiple market depths. I started using One Inch last summer, and since then, it's become my go to aggregator. I use it every time I need to make a swap. They recently launched V2, which has a brand new API. It greatly improves their routing algorithm. And my favorite part about the V2 is the new UI. It's super clean and easy to use. These improvements ensure that you get the best rates on your swaps with the lowest possible response time. So the next time you need to make a swap, forget about getting the best rate or optimizing your gas fees. Make it easy on yourself. Just use One Inch. And you can let them know that we sent you by going to epicenter.rocks slash one inch. That's one I N C H. We'd like to thank One Inch for their support of the podcast. If you look at DAOs, one of the hallmarks is that you're that DAOs are able to make decisions with um, various stakeholders, right? So basically, if you look at blockchains, in a way, they could be described as super low throughput. DAOs. Uh, so basically you coordinate on um, a new version of a consensus algorithm uh, or you can stay on the old one and basically then you and basically the way that a decision is made is you fork and the the fork that kind of that feels legitimate to most people is legitimate. So ideally you'd want to make a lot more decisions than whether to upgrade the consensus protocol. So what what are the options here? So I imagine I mean, if you look at DAOs, um, they often deal with low participation and there's, you know, a problem around the bandwidth for, of the attention of individual people. H how do you make sure that a DAO can effectively create decisions between so many different stakeholders? Yeah, I mean, this is a good question and a challenge that I think um, uh, both uh, developers and other folks that are interested in DAOs are going to have to sort through. Um, so on the one hand, you have DAO or DAO-like structures. That's a debate as to whether or not Bitcoin and or Ethereum are and should be classified as DAOs. In my mind, I, I, I do view them as DAOs, uh, you know, where you have this uh, code base and consensus algorithm and other uh, aspects of the, of, of the blockchain that's kind of coordinating human decisions at the edges. Um, and or you have... You know, other forms of DAOs, what I would call more decentralized organizations where human decision making is kind of more at the forefront uh, and people are beginning uh, to use blockchain technology in order to, uh, to coordinate their activity. Um, at the same time, and one of the major benefits of DAOs is that they lower transaction costs, right? The thought is by using smart contracts, by using blockchain technology, by using other aspects, you can reduce the cost and friction uh, of coordination uh, so the transaction costs go down. Uh, at the same time, there's one transaction cost that you can't limit with blockchain technology, and that's attention, right? So there's there's a cost to accumulating information, to assembling it, to processing it, to taking and making decisions related to uh, a certain organization. Um, and that's why I think in part we see low participation rates. Uh, not everybody is going to be engaged. They're not going to invest their time, energy um, to actually get up to speed on certain decisions. Uh, so you see in some DAOs that the participation rates are very, very low. Um, and in my mind, that's not surprising. Uh, when we spent, when I spent time in the Wikipedia ecosystem, it was very, very hard to get people to edit anything, right? To even click the edit button uh, to change one word on Wikipedia, it was about 2% um, uh, of the users of Wikipedia would actually click the edit button and a fraction of a percent would actually make an edit. Uh, so it's not surprising, uh, particularly in online environments, that people are not going to be actively participating. Uh, many people just like to lurk and read and, and kind of process. Um, I think, though, 
we see something a little bit different in some of the DAOs that we put together, most notably in the Lao and also Flamingo, where the participation rates are higher. They're at like 60 to 70 percent. I think that's in part because the amount of assets that uh, that folks are, are assembling together is higher. So there's more at stake. Right. So uh, they're able to um, and are more committed to actually taking actions or weighing in on certain things because there's a financial incentive for them to do so. And because they've put up, they've contributed a fair amount of capital as part of this collective. So I think that that's one way that um, that some of these uh, solutions may be uh, addressed. It, it could just be making sure that people put enough at stake in order to guarantee a, a sufficient amount of participation. At the same time, I think we're seeing other experiments where uh, they're flipping kind of the, the question. And uh, so the folks at Colony, I know, are, are looking at this, and I think it's quite interesting. Uh, they're basically saying that if you put up something up for proposal, it will pass unless people vote against it. So they're changing uh, the dynamic, which I think is uh, clever and smart. Uh, so if uh, people aren't um, you know, violently uh, opposed to a certain um, activity or something that's going on within a DAO, uh, things will move forward. Right? You have an implied uh, consensus around that, but the folks that are part- uh, participating are paying attention at that point in time. If they see something that goes wrong, uh, they're able to block that. Uh, I think we're also seeing other forms of governance mechanisms, whether that's um, you know weighing different conviction um, related to a certain activity um, that people are going to experiment with to kind of solve this attention issue. Uh, but the big barrier, uh, in my mind at least, is this: the cost of attention. Right? There's cost uh, associated and affiliated with it, um, and that's that's something that we're going to need to figure out ways to uh, to deal with. Um, but the nice thing about DAOs is that we can actually play around with these mechanics for the first time. Right? We have a sandbox uh, or uh, an ecosystem where we can take these governance-related decisions and not the complex governance-related decisions that we have for kind of core blockchains, but smaller groups of people, um, and we can begin to play around with different ways to address that. So if we want to optimize for high participation, well, we can play around with different uh, approaches and uh, implementations to do that. Maybe we don't want that, right? That's what the folks at Colony are beginning to think about. Maybe we don't want, we have to assume there's not going to be high participation. You know, maybe we need to deal with it at that point in time. Maybe we use markets and and, uh, some sort of prediction market to make decisions, right? Lots of folks are interested in that as well. Um, But at least now we have the framework to begin to explore those things. And and that's very different than the traditional world. Um, And that's in part why uh, I find this space so interesting. Uh, These governance decisions, which are very hierarchical, hierarchical in the sense of like a corporation, uh, or fairly hierarchical when it comes to a traditional fund structure, they've been kind of set in stone uh, over the past 50 to several hundred years. And now we have the opportunity to begin to play around and experiment with new forms. Uh, and my sense is through that experimentation, even though we don't know the right answer, we'll figure out better ways to, to begin to govern ourselves and, and hopefully make better decisions. Uh, and I think particularly in today's times, uh, that's, that's sorely needed across the board, uh, no, no matter where we are. <laughs> so around 10 years ago or so in, in Europe, there was this huge wave of euphoria in IT circles for liquid democracy, where basically you would delegate your vote depending on the topic to different people. Do you think something something like this has a future in the context of DAOs? Yeah, I mean, I, I think we're starting to see the threads of that. So a more traditional lawyer would call that proxy voting. Uh, so proxy voting has existed in corporate in corporate context for quite some time. Uh, so you can provide somebody else the authorization to vote on your behalf. Uh, the problem when it comes to more traditional corporations or legal entities, there's a lot of expense and cost in, in providing uh, a third party with uh, the ability to vote on your behalf. Uh, there's a lot of difficulty and expense in kind of aggregating those votes. You have to usually use a third party service to implement like some sort of uh, shareholder vote or other other voting scheme. So it's quite expensive. on a on a blockchain or an Ethereum, it's, it's super easy, right? You pretty much have to put an address, uh, sign a transaction, pay a little bit of gas, and then that person can be your proxy. So on the Moloch V2 smart contracts that uh, we help put together uh, that undergird uh, the Lao and also Flamingo, we already have delegated voting. Uh, other DAO frameworks have it as well. And we're starting to see in some of these uh, organizational DAOs related to open source technology, things that are trying to manage Uh, DeFi protocols or other emerging blockchain protocols, we're starting to see services built on top of it. Uh, So Boardroom is a good example there. 
uh, where they're beginning to make it easier for you to basically back a protocol politician so that that person um, can make and or take a, an action on your behalf. So I think the it's there, it, the substrate is there, right? Like the basic core functions are there, uh, but the tooling isn't yet mature. The, the ecosystem of DAOs is not yet mature, but I do think we'll start to see uh, things that are what I think you could call liquid democracy or kind of a more advanced form of proxy voting uh, emerge in part. And I think that that could be a good solution to solve this information problem, right? If you are a protocol politician, if you're somebody that's aggregated a lot of votes from other folks that are participating in DAOs, then you may have an incentive to actually cut through that information, cut through the noise of whatever information these DAOs are producing and invest your time and resources to, to making good decisions. Uh, so I think it's I think it's a super fascinating part of of kind of emerging DAO governance. Do you think there's an upper limit to how many people can coordinate within a DAO? Yeah, th this is a good question. So um, and here you can go back to some famous economists. So Ronald Coase actually wrote um, not just about transaction costs, but he also wrote about uh, transaction costs and organizations and how they form and how they're structured. Uh, he has a, some pretty prescient. Um, writings on, on this um, topic where he noted that when the cost of organizing um, um, and when uh, the ability to disseminate information related to an organization uh, is reduced. So you can think of that as the smart contract based DAO frameworks that people are putting together and then the internet as a means of propagation. It suggests that you should have organizations that are much larger in scale. Um, and that's why I think you've seen some folks say that DAOs at some point should be able to coordinate, you know, tens, hundreds, uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. Um, I do think that the entropy and the, the complexity of organizations that are much, much larger uh, may provide some sort of upward bound. Uh, but I do think uh, we can get to DAOs that are of that size, uh, assuming that scalability solutions are, are implemented, there's innovations when it comes to governance mechanisms, and I just think naturally they'll gravitate towards larger organizations. You know, that being said, um, in, in the Lao and also Flamingo, it's a, it's a much smaller group of people. So due to U.S. legal regulations, it's, it's capped at 99 members. Um, and we found that even though it's not five people, uh, it's, it's kind of like a smaller roving band of, uh, of folks, Uh, that it, it actually is working pretty well, right? As noted before, we have participation rates that are high, much higher than what you see in other DAOs, um, and you, you also have some form of cohesion. Uh, but I do think that at some point, DAOs are going to get quite large. Um, and it, that's not surprising, right? We have corporations that are quite large, too. Uh, so if you look at some of the largest corporations in the world, uh, you may not be fans of those corporations, you may not like their products, but they're coordinating hundreds of thousands of people, whether that's like a McDonald's or like a a Walmart, uh, or even a government, right? They're, they're coordinating the activity of lots and lots and lots of different people. So I don't see conceptually why DAOs wouldn't be able to do the same thing. I think the, the framework component of this is, is what's most interesting here. It, it, it's sort of a governance system to end all governance systems because the governance system itself can evolve to uh, cater the needs of, uh, of, of how it scales. So setting aside... Uh, platform scaling uh, uh, problems, like so, like the ability for Ethereum, for example, to process transactions uh, at scale. Um, the the governance system itself can uh, evolve as the size of the number of participants grows. Right. So uh, we were talking about this earlier. Um, uh, a governance model that implements a, a Gini coefficient, for example, that is malleable based on the inequality of um, of wealth in the system. But you could also think of a governance system that evolves based on the number of participants. So it could start off, for example, as a very sort of stake-based system. But as you start approaching higher bounds of users, then it turns into something you know, more akin to a democracy where you have like a one person, one vote uh, type of system. I, I, personally, I think this is just uh, like the most fascinating uh, aspect of this is that it, it, it's, it's governance technology Or governance as well, uh, from a, from a meta perspective. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the other areas outside of, I think those are really great examples. I do think DAOs can also explore multi-token models, which I, I think are underexplored at this point. We're starting to see some projects that are digging in a bit more there. But um, I do think multi-token models could be helpful to start to segregate 
people and DAOs into maybe different groups or folks that have different rights or are weighing in on, on different decisions, uh, which can allow for specialization and maybe cut through some of the some of the noise or some of the challenges of coordination. So it's a playground, right? It's a governance it's a, a governance framework, a governance playground. Uh, we have the ability to to do the same thing to organizations like we've done to software, which has evolved over time, um, and that's important um, and something that um, that I do think is going to you know to go back to your question before you know coordinate a whole bunch of different people start to seep into lots of different uh, places uh, because it's probably more efficient, right? If you have better governance and you have lower cost, uh, abil- the ability to operate these organizations at lower cost. It should be, in the long arc of history, the endpoint for organizations, right? There's probably not going to be a reason to have a corporation or an LLC or some of the existing organizations we have today if you have something that can get propagated around the globe, is entirely digitally native, uh, has you know lower costs to operate, and also has the ability to actually uh, solve some of the corporate governance or just governance in general issues that, that we know that the existing organizations have. Developers can experiment and figure out the kind of right approach there. Can you illustrate um, how a mighty token DAO might work? Yeah, so this is something we've thought quite a bit about. Uh, so, you know, there's lots of legal challenges, obviously, around DAOs, and I'm sure we'll probably dive into that at some point. Um, you know, one question is, if there's a profit that's made, who should be entitled to that profit? Uh, in the U.S. and in other jurisdictions, we say that only folks that are Uh, Wealthy, accredited investors should be able to hold those tokens, trade those tokens, etc. And while those are, in my opinion, dreadful policies, that is just kind of the the law of of at least uh, my land um, and many other folks' uh, land. Um, With a multi-token model, though, you could uh, support those requirements whereby folks that may be entitled to distributions are, let's say, accredited or wealthy and able to satisfy the requirements, but maybe you want other folks to weigh in on governance. So you could have a multi-token model uh, where you split economic rights from governance rights. Um, And that may be kind of a first step towards uh, the democratization of some of these organizations where you're gaining the benefit and the wisdom of a group of people that may be interested in a project, whether it's an open source project or or otherwise, that can weigh in uh, on decisions, but at the same time Uh, the the value transfer is kind of held by another party. You can almost think about it, and I I have a a U.S. perspective here, as a separation between the House and the Senate, right? You can have uh, the House, the the folks that have the governance votes saying, hey, you should be paying attention to this. This is important to us. We believe in this project, but anything dealing with assets or transferring assets would go through another House, right? The the folks that have another token. Um, And maybe that's a, a decent way to to a navigate some uh, some legal requirements and b uh, ensure an uh, appropriate separation of powers we've already segued a little bit into into the legal model of DAOs now so I mean obviously the legal framework has come I don't want to say a long way but it, it's it's come some way since the DAO so if you speak with legal DAO people they it, they typically distinguish between wrapped and unwrapped DAOs. Can can you explain to us um, what the distinction here is? Sure. So there's always been a question when it comes to DAOs as to what they would be characterized under the law um, and what are some of the uh, tricky legal questions that may emerge. The the first time I learned of these questions, there's some great programs that MIT put together right before Ethereum launched, uh, looking at Bitcoin and Ethereum and other blockchain technology. Um, and we began to have a conversation about, well, let's let's assume that a DAO exists. What would it be characterized as, at least in the U.S. and in many other parts of the globe? Uh, they'd be characterized as general partnerships, which um, which means that each partner uh, would be responsible for the activities of the other partners, uh, both from a liability perspective and potentially also from a financial perspective. So that's not a great place to start. So folks began to think about, well, how can we limit that? Uh, and they looked at different organizations that exist today. Um, and looked at organizations like a limited liability company or some co-ops or other other forms of organizations and began to think about, well, why don't we use this vehicle as a legal wrapper? Um, we'll wrap it in this more traditional entity, but the engine of it will actually be administered entirely or primarily through software uh, or some sort of software-based system. Uh, so that's the idea of kind of a wrapped DAO, where you, you have a DAO that's embedded within a traditional legal entity uh, but it's operating 
the way that uh, folks that want to participate in DAOs and or the developers of the DAOs are intending, i.e. operating you know, via software. Um, and we've seen some, uh, some early experiments in, in that vein. Uh, so from kind of these more academic conversations, we've seen over the past couple of years, folks like Ross Campbell, who's on uh, the OpenMod team, who's, who set these up, and the DORG team uh, begin to explore what wrapped uh, DAOs would look like in the U.S. Um, and then obviously with the Lao and Flamingo, uh, Flamingo DAO, we've been pushing on that some more. Uh, the way they tend to work is that they're a limited liability company in the U.S. Um, that uh, modifies almost uh, a number of the default rules under the law, which is permitted, uh, using a contract, a traditional legal contract, uh, such that it can set up something that's akin to what people want in a DAO. So what does that tend to mean? Uh, well, I can't speak to all the projects, but I can speak to what we've done on the Lao and Flamingo side. It means that uh, when you join the DAO, you're not joining as a partner. Um, you're joining without, um, and to the extent limited by law, um, without any other fiduciary duties to your, to your other uh, DAO members. Uh, you're agreeing that potential conflicts of interest are waived so that we can kind of preserve this arm's length notion of, of how DAOs operate. Uh, we're making clear that the underlying smart contracts are governing the behavior of folks within the organization. Uh, so it's not as extreme as what we saw with the, the DAO itself, where they pretty much had a terms of service that said the code rules or something to, to that effect. Um, but it's trying to kind of preserve that same that same feeling. And then it's dealing with other issues that, that lawyers worry about, things like dispute resolution, things like representations and warranties, these very boring basic things that just help clear out some of the cruft if something goes wrong. Um, and so that that's how we've set it up. It's set up as a, a member-managed limited liability company with the default rules related to how those limited liability companies operate modified such that it can accommodate a DAO. Uh, the US, at least in my understanding, is a bit unique here. Uh, there's no need to have a manager of a legal entity in the US. They can be entirely member managed. Uh, they can enjoy a limitation of liability, which means that they're not responsible um, for, uh, for activities uh, related to the organization, except to the extent that um, it relates to their activities within the organization. And uh, it's, it's been growing uh, pretty quickly. Uh, in terms of in terms of um, in terms of development, so I assume that the ninety nine member limit kind of arises out of that. What's the constraint here, and is there any way to lift this? So those are not organizational or corporate law constraints, um, and uh, instead those are uh, other constraints that are in the U.S. related to securities laws and a related statute called the Investment Advisor Act. Uh, so for uh, DAOs that want to pool capital and deploy it for investment purposes, uh, there's uh, a couple additional concerns. One is, what are the interests of the DAO itself? Uh, are they securities or are they not securities? And I know, uh, as a longtime listener, you guys have spent quite some time looking at, at some of the legal issues related to tokens, so I don't think we need to go into that. But it, it's not that dissimilar from some of those challenges that we saw with uh, characterizing tokens from you know the 2016 to 2018 uh, token sale you've Euphoria. And then related to that, you know, if, um, if you pool together capital from a lot of different people, the U.S. tends to view it as, a, as something akin to like a mutual fund, and you have to go public at that point in time. So there's some limitations, the most notable one being if it's under 100 people, uh, then those requirements don't necessarily apply. So those are some other, um, some other kind of um, parameters that we, we kind of had to navigate through. And so that's why in the Lao you have, uh, at its core, it's a limited liability company that defers almost entirely to software. Um, it deals with all these ancillary issues like we saw with the DAO in terms of limitation of liability, in terms of questions related to fiduciary responsibilities, including questions related to dispute resolution. Um, and then at the same time, to comply with securities and or the Investment Advisor Act, it's limited to 99 members. In the abundance of caution, we've limited it to accredited investors, although my, my personal belief here is we shouldn't have needed to do that. Um, and that's, that's kind of a separate issue, but something that we're hoping to fight over the long run. Um, and um, it's, it's grown pretty well. You know, so the Lao, as an example, started with about a half a million dollars worth of Ether um, in April of this year. Uh, at least as of today, it's circulating around $15 million. Uh, Flamingo Dow has about $5 million in it. 
Uh, and just to give you a point of comparison, you know, the Dow when it launched had about $50 million. So using this approach, uh, we're about halfway to where the Dow was, uh, just taking a little bit slower of a burn uh, in terms of, of kind of growing out the ecosystem. To what extent do you think the the frameworks of the limited liability company can dissolve into the code? Like I'm thinking about things like dispute resolution, for example. These are things where we've already observed, you know, a significant number of examples in the blockchain space where we have dispute resolution, like things like, like, like Aragon, of course, the Aragon court. When do you think, you know, we'll be able to have a, a sort of like legal DAO that exists only as a DAO? Is that even where there's no wrapper uh, company around it? Yeah, uh, I think that dispute resolution, at least for it to be enforced by traditional courts, it's going to need some sort of legal agreement that's attached to it. It doesn't necessarily need to be a, a heavy handed one, uh, but there's a certain provisions that if they're in a binding contract and if they defer to some sort of arbitration system, whether it's uh, you know, a digital based on, on uh, arbitration system or some other more traditional arbitration system, it will be deemed enforceable. Um, so I do think there'll be uh, pretty much like a light uh, light wrappers around a lot of DAO structures, particularly sophisticated ones, and particularly ones where the the amount of assets that they want to administer or um, pool uh, are are fairly large. Um, I think until there's an actual modification of the core statutes to to permit this, um, you're going to have to have some some sort of light penning on it. You know that being said. If you can wrap it uh, or wrap uh, a DAO or, or at least wrap some sort of relationship with an, uh, a contract and that contract does have an arbitration provision in place, at least in the U.S., um, it's pretty hard to impeach that. Uh, so the way I, I view this in, in many ways is these contracts create the space so that people can experiment in the digital world. You can actually begin to kind of quarantine out um, the ability for more traditional um entities like courts, et cetera, to begin to administer what's going on in the online world, um, with the caveat being that it doesn't obviously absolve criminal-related questions and concerns. So, Right. This is something I totally neglected is the enforcement aspect, which, of course, uh, for the time being at least, and probably for the foreseeable future, uh, relies on, on the state enforcing. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you see some early examples and there's some great projects where that's beginning to get challenged, right? So one, I do think underappreciated thing about smart contracts is that they can in effect enforce, right? The question is, how do you get a claim on those assets uh, via a smart contract, right? So unless people are depositing the amounts in dispute into some sort of smart contract, an online uh, dispute resolution provision comes in place and that arbitrator or group of folks has the ability to administer those assets, you probably are going to you know, want to file that in a uh, traditional court, especially if you've lost a tremendous amount of money and, and enforce against that. Uh, so I, I think I think we'll get there, but we're not, there's not enough enough assets that are able to be easily managed on chain. And some of these uh, questions related to um, giving an arbitrator the ability to settle a dispute are still not fully worked out, uh, although I, I imagine folks will figure that out um, such that we can kind of have a full closed loop system. But if that falls in place, and you wrap it in a legal agreement, there's not much that a court can do to un- unwrap it if, if it's done appropriately uh, and if the decision is, is administered in a, in a reasonable way. Um, and there's obviously exceptions to that, but it makes it really, really difficult to do that. And that means that we can kind of move into an entirely digital framework, which is something I'm interested in and kind of shed some of the more traditional aspects of the legal system, et cetera. Let's dive into unwrap DAOs um, a little bit later, but there's also, I mean, so basically in the, in the, when you talked about the wrap DAOs, you kind of talked about giving um, the DAOs a legal personality of like some sort of legacy system. There's also novel legislation that actually sees DAOs as um, a uh, legal, that kind of imbues them with legal personality in their own right, right? Um, can, can you talk about the legislation that's kind of come into force there or that's going to come into force soon um, and how you see that? Yeah, sure. So um, in the U.S. there's been a, a couple attempts at kind of legally recognizing DAOs. The first one it was in, a state of, in the state of Vermont, uh, which passed a, an act called the uh, BB Blockchain-Based LLC, 
Uh, so the BBLC, it was a, a really important but pretty narrow act that just said if you have an LLC, uh, you can uh, designate it a BBLC, uh, blockchain-based LLC, and that's going to be fine under Vermont law. Um, I, along with other folks, have been working with um, some state senators in the state of Wyoming, which has passed a, a number of bills related to blockchain technology. Uh, Caitlin Long, who I imagine many of many of uh, the folks that are listening uh, are aware of, she's been uh, historically spearheading that effort, although I think other folks are jumping in increasingly there as well. Um, and the idea is, and this is a, a bill that's been pushed through uh, a committee in Wyoming, uh, is that you'd be able to set up a DAO in Wyoming. So, you know, XYZ DAO. So it can actually be called a DAO. It'll be recognized uh, by the state of Wyoming. Uh, you'll file one document. So instead of extensive paperwork, and if you've ever set up a business, you get a stack of paperwork that your lawyer or lawyers will prepare. You have to sign a whole bunch of different things. It's very confusing. Uh, so the thought here is let's strip that all away. You can file one document. It's called a, an Articles of Organization. It identifies the underlying smart contracts that are managing the system. Uh, you're designating uh, the DAO as either a member-managed DAO, or one where humans are involved, or an algorithmic DAO, um, where an algorithm is involved. You can put in place any legal provisions that you need uh, to either account for things like dispute resolution, um, modify certain provisions to just make sure it fits neatly on, onto your organization. Um, and then you can file this document and you will have a DAO. Uh, and what's also interesting about what Wyoming is pushing towards, they've authorized this, although it's not built yet. Uh, they want to make it feasible so that you can file things in Wyoming via an API. Uh, so I think we're rapidly getting towards a future uh, where you're going to be able to set up uh, an organization, um, you know, hopefully from command line, right? You'll be able to load up a uh, terminal, uh, type in a couple of commands, um, and you know, push that to Wyoming, uh, push some code to Ethereum, and your organization is, is set up. Um, and on some of the automation tooling, that's in part why we built things like OpenLaw. You should be able to automatically generate those filing documents as well, right? That's incredible. Maybe pay the fees in Ether as well, like just right there in your in your code. Yeah, or you know, or USDC. I, I don't know, or you know, but. Some, something that presumably and, and will hopefully be settled on on Ethereum. Um, and and that's amazing. And, and not only is that amazing that you, you could soon be able to do that, it's also amazing that the cost of setting up the organization should go down, right? So just like we saw with software, um, if, if the agreements themselves, this document that you need to file becomes standardized or if there's a couple templates that people can use. The smart contract code is standardized, something like the Moloch framework or some future framework. Um, and, and the cost that Wyoming charges to set up an organization are not unreasonable. It's several hundred dollars, which I know it may be a, a unreasonable for some, but in the scheme of things is a lot better than where we are today. Um, that's pretty incredible, right? Um, instead of spending tens of thousands of dollars talking to lawyers that are going to run you in circles, um, you know, putting together agreements that in many ways are unnecessary uh, or unnecessarily complex, um, you'll be able to hopefully, uh, you know, treat it like any other software, just another task that you need to do. Uh, another thing that you can click off uh, your, your, uh, your checklist. The, the very idea of interacting with any government authority over an API is something that I never thought I would see in my lifetime. <laughs> Living in <laughs> France, I never thought this would, would be something I would see in my lifetime, but this is very, very cool. Yeah. So, you know, the API piece, I, you know, I think they're well-intentioned. I don't know how far along that is in development, but um, I think that, that that's where we'll get at, at, at some point. Um, and then on this, at the same time, I think going back to what we were talking about before, then we'll see experimentation on governance and, and really have a hopefully a framework to begin to do that. Can I just loop in there? So basically, if, if you talk about the internal governance of the DAO, I assume that the state of Wyoming won't be able to butt in there, right? So because you can, you can have all kinds of internal dispute resolution that Wyoming wouldn't be able to facilitate and that kind of that holds is, is is that so and so basically the legal personality that the DAO has is only in external circumstances so basically it can enter into a contract with like a supplier or it can it can contract people to do things for it and can open a bank account but uh, i assume there's no dispute resolution and you can't you can't sue um, a fellow 
DAO member in front of a Wyoming court for the breach of contract or whatever, I assume? I mean, you could. Um, the Wyoming courts would have the ability to administer any disputes for any Wyoming entity. But in general, in the U.S., the U.S. loves contracts. We love them. Um, we think that they're absolutely fantastic. Uh, what legal academics would call this is private ordering. So we enable to a great degree and probably to the great greatest degree in the world the ability of individuals or groups of individuals to organize their affair using contracts. Um, and the state has very limited ability to upend that. Um, and that includes to decide how you want to administer disputes. You want to use Aragon Court, and that's in a contract, and that's written down clearly. All folks have signed it. You're going to use Aragon Court, right? There's there's not going to be much much choice. So if you walked into Wyoming uh, and talked to a judge there, he's going to say, well, look, in this contract, you agreed to use Aragon Court. So what, what are you doing here, right? Go to Aragon Court and get that administered. And if you're trying to kind of work around that, you're not going to have much wiggle room to, to do that. And in general, the state doesn't really get in into the affairs uh, of private enterprises, right? Whether that's a corporation, you know, and or um, a, a company. Uh, and what that would mean is also a DAO. Uh, there's obviously lots of exceptions to that, but in general, they're, they're fairly narrow. Um, and that's exciting. Um, the, there's certain abilities, though, in this statute for Wyoming to, uh, you know, basically unregister a DAO if it goes completely haywire. And that's something that we were concerned about. Um, and there's also, if you're going to have a purely algorithmic system, there's a requirement. Now you're getting, you know, like a charter from the state of Wyoming, so you have to give something up. Um, and what, what uh, we propose that folks have to give up to set up an entirely algorithmic system, so something to kind of manage this future autonomous car that uh, I think folks uh, are thinking about, it's just that it's upgradable, right, uh, in some capacity. There has to be some ability to upgrade it. Uh, so that's a trade-off that I think the state senators, uh, at least those on the committee, thought, thought was somewhat reasonable. Uh, and that may change over time as it goes through committee, et cetera. But, uh. One of the dispute resolution things that have come to mind, and I don't know if you, you guys have thought about this, but it, what, what, what if one of the members of the DAO is another DAO? And how does that, how would one then handle dispute resolution when you have perhaps like a, a sort of cascading DAOs, right, that uh, at some point have ownership in a DAO and there's there's a dispute that needs to happen there, right, uh, or dispute resolution. Yeah, well, that, that happens all the time, right, in traditional legal arrangements, right, like a corporation can be a shareholder in another corporation or a corporation could be a shareholder in an LLC and the LLC will have an agreement that has an arbitration provision. So you just have to find kind of the operative agreement to deal with the dispute, and then you, you look to that. So that's why, to your previous point, I, I just think that there's probably going to be some light pinning with some legal uh, documents. It could be something like what we're building on the open law side, where you're able to automatically generate them for more complex things. It could be something even like a terms of service or you know some sort of click-through like related agreement that, that, will, that will kind of deal with some of these types of questions. Can I just ask one last question on the Wyoming framework? So basically, if, if your DAO goes haywire and it's kind of deregistered by Wyoming, what then happens? Because, I mean, basically, it's on the blockchain. It doesn't, you can't unsummon it. It's still there. So basically, it does it no longer have legal personality or what? what exactly. Does yeah. it, so it defaults back to a general partnership? Is that it? Or is that? Uh... Exactly. Yeah, that's the thought. I mean, there's not, the state can't, they can't take it down, right? Um, you know, the one thing, if it is upgradable, that could be conceivably part of some sort of court order, right? Um, that, you know, you, you need to upgrade it so that it no longer is operating. Uh, you know, these are the edge cases. I imagine over over time, those edge cases will become a little bit more magnified. So that that's the concern uh, that folks have. But as, as you know, and as I'm sure many of the, uh, the folks listening in know, once something's deployed in Ethereum, uh, or other, you know, comparable blockchain-based systems, it's it's hard to put the genie back in the bottle if people want to use it. So that's some of the challenges. This is so cool. I'm 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 super excited to see how this actually plays out. And so it, it's going to be wild. Um. So what, maybe wait, 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 wait. I got, I got another one here. <laughs> what What about if a DAO summons another DAO and you know through this this API like creates another legal entity? Can we have a DAO owning a DAO? In Wyoming, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't see why not. I mean, it's the same thing 
traditional corporate structures, you'll have a corporation that has a subsidiary, right? So, uh, you know, with the Lao, we're already members of other DAOs, and that's been mediated entirely through just smart contract-based calls. So it's already possible to do this. So, you know, the, the Lao is a member of PyDAO, and so the members voted that they wanted to join PyDAO, um, and then we did, right? Uh, so once the vote happened, right, smart contracts were triggered. Once the smart contracts were tr- triggered, it, it interfaced with uh, you know the Aragon DAO that that undergirds PyDAO, and and we joined. So you know I I think it's going to happen. There's nothing technically limiting that ability to happen. Yeah, there's nothing technically limiting it. I just wonder what kind of complexities might arise when you have sort of like DAOs and child DAOs and child DAOs being completely automated and autonomous themselves forming like new DAOs through some sort of an API and then like uh, I don't know I mean, it just seems like a, a, like a, a beast nest of complexities to me <laughs> with some some sentient AI uh, administering the the entire thing so, yeah. yeah I mean not even an AI just it, it could be pretty simple business logic I mean I think like the to come back to the Mike Hearn autonomous vehicle I think like in his example there was this this notion that at some point, if the vehicle had sufficient capital, it could invest in other vehicles and those would be sort of autonomous vehicles in themselves and there would be like a child vehicle or the other. So this 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 kind of thing has always fascinated me since I've heard this story. So this kind of like just um, awakens all those fascinations again. Yeah, again, I don't th- I don't think that there's there's nothing conceptually that would limit that. There's a couple technical requirements in it. You need, the entities need to have a registered agent, which is basically like a, a point of somebody to contact in the state of Wyoming. So that would have to be accounted for. Um, but you know, you don't need to have a manager. Like, a, like there's nothing necessarily saying that you need to have a manager uh, of an organization. You need to have you know some legal person that would probably file it. So th- that's a big question. I don't know what's going to happen with this API and whether or not. Um, uh, there'll be some sort of like technical issue that may that may muck up what you're just describing, but I don't see why you would necessarily not want that to occur. I mean, we already en- enable humans to do that. Why wouldn't some sort of algorithmic system have the the same same general ability to do that? I agree. Yeah, it's it, but it's a good question. I don't I haven't fully thought that through, but I'm gonna make sure to spend some more time thinking that through over the next couple of days. Maybe your next book. <laughs> <laughs> so if you look back at at the history of organizations. It kind of seems, it seems weird now, but I mean, you didn't always have shareholder based organizations, right? So basically, if you look at, uh, if you look at the Dutch East India company that was founded, I believe in 1602, um, and that was the first one of those. Do you think this is that moment again? Um, do you think DAOs are, are going to, um, have an al- analogous position in our society and legal system? So my belief is yes, right? For the reasons described before, you have an organization that can propagate anywhere around the globe via the internet. And I do think smart contract based organizations will just be cheaper and cheaper to administer. And presumably over the next X number of years, we'll develop uh, superior governance mechanisms. Um, And that's a big question and you can disagree with that, but that's my belief. Uh, So I think that this is going to be the the default, almost like how folks argue that Bitcoin is the soundest money, and obviously all money um, over time, at least as the argument goes, will, will gravitate towards the soundest money. Uh, I personally think that DAOs will be and are uh, the soundest organization um, for the digital age. And that means that increasingly, I think you're going to see more and more organizations uh, begin to operate via DAOs. And this is not fully surprising. So you mentioned the Dutch East India Company. Um, but if you even go further back in time, people have been setting up organizations of different stripes for millennia. You know, Romans had limited liability entities to deal with trade and shipping. Uh, we, obviously, we saw uh, the Dutch and then English uh, state chartered corporations that really led to the age of exploration um, with all the benefits and the downsides related to that. Uh, in the U.S., though, you know, we, we came up with the state chartered corporation that was 1811 in New York. So we said, why do I have to ask permission from the state? I should just be able to set this up uh, anytime I want if I satisfy these requirements. Very, uh, very American way to approach it. Uh, and then corporations became the dominant form. When there was the railroad boom in the 18, um, you know, in the 18, mid to late 1800s in the US, it led to the birth of preferred stock or different 
forms of stock that a company can have, uh, which is what fuels venture capital investing. Uh, when we saw the increasing uh, internationalization of finance, we saw the birth of the limited liability company, which is what predominates in, um, in, in the U.S. now for many businesses. Uh, so I think for each technical age and each technical innovation, we've seen kind of a, a, a subsequent shift in the way we decide to organize our affairs. Um, and I think that DAOs are that shift for the Internet. Um, there's no reason why you shouldn't have an organization that can stretch across the globe that's lightweight, uh, that kind of reflects the behaviors of how people interact, right? They don't necessarily want to join together as like partners, like venturing out to, to do something. Uh, they don't want necessarily to be have somebody in charge of them in some sort of, you know, uh, top-down hierarchical way. Uh, they want something that's looser, uh, more at arm's length, um, and that relies on software so they can actually uh, begin to coordinate things because it's a bit more trustworthy than these, you know, paper-based agreements that are that are hard to administer or expensive to put together um, and specific to a particular jurisdiction. So uh, I just don't see how DAOs don't win, win in the long run. And I think we're starting to see that play out. I don't know if, if, if you've looked at the numbers, and uh, I do like numbers, but if you go to platforms like DeepDAO, which is a, a really great platform if you haven't been there, that's uh, taking a stock at the DAO ecosystem, at the beginning of this year, there was about a little under $10 million uh, worth of digital assets in DAOs. And it's up to almost 500 million. Uh, and the last time I saw uh, growth like that, uh, I think it would be DeFi, right? Uh, when we saw, you know, in, in 20, you know, 17, 18, when we started seeing the first DeFi projects kind of emerge, uh, there was a couple of people, um, you know, a couple projects that were getting some traction. Uh, but I, I think in the DAO ecosystem, we're gonna we're gonna see similar levels of growth. Uh, I think that's particularly true for the DAOs that you mentioned before, those managing open source projects. I, I do think the developers have a significant amount of demand to, to either have their assets or the entire project kind of managed in a more democratic, participatory way. So I think we're going to see a lot of growth here. And then as the blockchain ecosystem continues to grow, it eclipses more than a trillion dollars in assets, you know, tens if not hundreds of trillions of dollars, then it's just going to be difficult for organizations to compete. And they're going to have to, you know, they're going to have to copy it just like, just like they always have done. So that's, uh, that's how I see things playing out. Super cool. So just before we dive into the current DAO ecosystem, um, one last theoretical question on DAO. So basically we've talked about um, rap DAOs in both legacy uh, rappers and novel rappers. What about unwrapped DAO? So if you don't actually have a legal wrapper for your DAO, is there any way to not automatically default into becoming a general partnership? Yeah, so this is the tricky part. It's going to depend on who's members, and it's going to depend on all the jurisdictions in which they reside. Um, so at least in the U.S. and in Europe, that tends to be, and I'm not a European lawyer, but this is my understanding, it, that tends to be a general partnership. The, that's also why I think it does make sense to have some sort of contract in place amongst the members. Uh, I call those uh, contractarian DAOs. So you can have um, a contract, even if you're not legally recognized, just governing the affairs of the different uh, members and potentially limiting or waiving rights that you think are sensible um, as a as a group uh, to the extent permitted by by law and that's a complex question you know which law governs you know what rights you're able to to waive and you know some things you can waive some things you can't when it comes to a partnership but at least I think that gives you um, some shot at organizing things and dealing with these these risks it's you know being a lawyer is a little bit like being a security researcher you're not thinking about the happy path you're thinking about the bad path right and we saw some dramatic bad paths with like the DAO itself where there was big questions and and if there wasn't the hard fork and you know people really lost their shirt my sense is the courts would have weighed in at that point in time um, but you know dealing with some of those downside risks I, I think are important uh, particularly if you're trying to build something that's you know potentially massive we're even seeing that in the maker DAO ecosystem right as maker DAO is becoming more and more important as DAO is becoming a more uh, essential asset to the crypto ecosystem and potentially other ecosystems. These types of legal questions uh, about who's responsible is the foundation, is it somebody else? Uh, they're beginning to come into focus. Uh, and I do think agreements that are put in place can can kind of uh, stave off those forms of what I call like regulatory attacks in the, in the future. So um, that's something folks should consider. Um, and I think there's some great projects that are already considering that. And I think we'll start to see some more more uh, following that path too. 
because legal recognition is not for everybody, right? So either philosophically or you know or otherwise. Um, but you know, we decided to go down that path, and the reason we kind of thought about it is it's a little bit like Coinbase. And I know Coinbase is a bit of a, a, a touchstone, but they took Mt. Gox, right? They just copied Mt. Gox and just said, "Hey, let's do it in the right way in the U.S." Um, in many ways, what we're we're trying to do with the Lao and this ecosystem is is explore the same thing. Like, can we do this in the right way just so we can push the ecosystem forward? Um, you know, we know that that's not going to be the right approach for everybody, though. Hmm. Speaking of ecosystems, so we, we've talked about lots of different DAOs today. We at least mentioned a few. You know, looking at the different DAOs that exist, do you have a way to categorize them? Like, how would you kind of put them in different uh, for different use cases or applications? Yeah, so I think um, I think one major category is this idea of using a DAO to coordinate an open source project. Right, I, I, I think we're seeing that first emerge in the blockchain ecosystem for DeFi projects, but I don't see any conceptual reason why that uh, should be limited to just blockchain projects. And I think we're seeing interesting experiments like Dev Protocol and some other interesting projects that are trying to kind of bring um, you know bring comparable models to other open source projects. Uh, so I think that's that's one area. I think the the second area would be uh, what we talked about before. These like base protocols. So that's an argument. Uh, I tend to think that they are kind of DAO like in structure. Things like Bitcoin and Ethereum. Uh, so I call those like protocol level DAOs. Um, and then I think um, I, th- I think that there's a lot of potential use cases around pooling capital. Uh, so if you think about a lot of industries at their core, what are they doing? They're pooling and deploying capital. So venture capital is an obvious example there, right? Uh, people pull together capital, make investments into projects. Um, but if you think about media, it's not that dissimilar. Uh, a label that may be funding music or some other form of creative endeavor, they're, they have capital, they have folks that decide where it gets deployed, they, they, so they pool capital and decide where it gets deployed, uh, very similar. So I think you're gonna start to see a lot more DAOs in, in that ecosystem. If you think about insurance, it's just pulling capital and deploying it. If you think about other forms of fund structures, whether that's hedge funds, private equity funds, et cetera, pulling and deploying capital. Um, and really any corporate form is, is not that dissimilar, right? If you're running a dev shop, you're, you're pulling instead of intangible capital, it's human capital, right? So um, you're pulling human capital and deploying it. So I think that the pooling of capital is the other major category, and that's the one that we're just beginning to explore with projects like the Lao and Flamingo Dow and, and, and a handful of other examples there too. So th- that's kind of my broad categorization there. You, you also have um, some sort of coordination tools, right? So basically, for instance, um, there's KeeperDAO, which hasn't been around that long. So basically for, uh, for organizing the extraction of MEV um, is probably how I would characterize it. Do you have any other um, DAOs that are centered around coordination and um, basically um, division of assets? Yeah, so I, I think that this is an interesting potential new frontier for DAOs. So viewing a DAO is almost like a like a a point for coordination or also a point for signaling. So you can view a DAO as almost like a, a bit like a web of trust of some sort. So if you're like interested in a particular topic or a particular project, you can you can see DAOs potentially be useful for curation or dissemination of uh, of certain things. So an example, we did this in, or for Flamingo DAO, which is an NFT focused DAO, we had a DAO drop uh, where an artist was able to drop onto all the members an NFT that uh, that they created. So they used the DAO as kind of like a, a, a vetted web of trust of folks that were interested in you know NFT or digital art related things. So I do think that there's going to be more forms of use cases for DAOs. I just think we're we're just starting to scratch the surface. And what we're doing is looking towards previous models and trying to apply them in the digital context, a little bit like Web1. And then we'll start to see some more kind of emergent things that we may not be able to think about, things like KeeperDAO, or things like using DAOs for curation or um, or, or other, other aspects like that that could also be potentially interesting. So I don't have all the answers, but um, I, I, and I definitely don't, but I think that there's lots of ingenious things that we'll be able to do with organizations now that we, we're effectively turning them into software. So what's the outlook here? Where, where do you see this space evolving in the next, say, decade? And what are some of the risks that you might perceive? I mean, one of the risks, and Frederica mentioned this in, the, in our show rundown, but 
I think given the current context with the you know, social media censorship that we've observed, you know, is there a space for DAOs to, to occupy some, uh, some of that space? And you know, what, are, what are potentially some of the risks that that might incur on society? Sorry, I went from a broad question to a super narrow question. But. No, well, you know, from my my vantage point, I hope that blockchain technology can come and and hopefully address some of the issues that I think we're seeing with centralized social media platforms and other services. And hopefully, by banding together um, in these more loose digitally native structures, we're able to replicate or, if not improve, um, improve what we're seeing uh, on social media. And otherwise, with all the caveats that about scalability and all the other issues with some of these broader kind of um, more consumer focused applications we'll have. I think the outlook for DAOs is bright. You know, I think it's one of the core use cases. It's something that's animated both the Bitcoin uh, and Ethereum communities for, you know, a number of years now. Uh, I think the tooling is is coming into place. So we we have shaken off this PTS DAO. I think Moloch DAO was wildly innovative. I think Amin and team who put that together uh, really deserve a pat on their backs. Uh, because I think it was tremendous work. Uh, I think we're going to continue to see some kind of core innovations around the underlying smart contract frameworks. Uh, so some issues that DAOs are facing uh, are not just regulatory questions, they're actually just nitty-gritty technical issues. It's very expensive to deploy a DAO, it's very expensive to run a DAO in terms of gas and other other issues. Uh, so I do think we're going to see innovation um, in, in that realm. Uh, you know, on the open law side, we've been working on this. Um, we've been putting together what we consider to be the third version of the Moloch DAO framework, which means that you'll be able to set up a more modular DAO. Uh, you'll have the ability to vote on governance-related decisions at no cost and transfer assets if there's no evidence of fraud at effectively um, the cost of transferring that asset, which is, you know, a couple bucks of gas, at least when, when things are not in, entirely insane. Um, which we think will lower the cost related to operating DAOs, which is a big pain point and a problem that needs to be solved. I think what we were talking about earlier in the show related to the appropriate way to get uh, people involved and and participating in these structures is something that needs to be solved. Uh, but I think we're getting close to, to having at least frameworks where people can begin to experiment there. And then the last is regulatory questions. So we may have figured out a way to set these things up, uh, but I'm not satisfied that we can only set up a DAO in the U.S. Uh, that's under 100 people. I want to see those DAOs that are tens of thousands of people. So I do think that there's the long slog of convincing the gray-haired and gray-beard um, politicians that that have a disproportionate weight on our lives um, that it's okay for people online to organize and do something productive together. I think that that's a pretty reasonable argument to make but and something that, that does need to be uh, does need to be made, and hopefully we'll be able to to begin to do that. Yeah, I mean, but if if I put my regulator hat on for a second, it's a beautiful, great hat. It's a it's a green hat uh, for some reason. <laughs> but if if I if I put that hat on and and uh, and I think okay, well, uh, this is great, but I mean, uh, a DAO can also allow for extremist groups to organize, for DAOs to also uh, serve purposes that are not in the common good. What What is your answer to that uh, concern? I think that's always a concern, right? But people can band together to to do bad things all the time, right? And plenty of people set up uh, legally recognized entities and perpetuate a tremendous amount of harm to begin with. So I think it's just like anything else. If you're putting together a DAO to set up an assassination market or something crazy like that, and it wouldn't be a good conversation if we don't dive into those types of questions. Uh, you know, there's other regulations that, that you can, you know, there's other regu- regulations that can apply there. Um, and if folks are doing bad activity and can be identified and that may become more challenging over time as, you know, cryptographic primitives become easier to, to implement, et cetera, then, you know, I think we're, gonna, we're just going to have to grapple with these types of questions. I, I, don't, I don't know. You, you can't, again, put the kind of genie back in the bottle. You just have to kind of deal with the, the hand that's dealt. How large do you think the overlap between regulatory um, reach and DAOs will be. So basically, if you look at technology where it's now and uh, where it's going, you can kind of see that it relies on centralized infrastructure increasingly less. And we see the rise of privacy-protecting technology uh, on Ethereum and other platforms. 
So in principle, it would be possible or feasible to actually partake in DAOs completely anonymously without being able to be traced. Do, do you think DAOs will evade regulatory capture? Or, I mean, basically, because laws are only as good as they are if you can enforce them, right? Basically, non-enforceable laws don't really, I mean, they just discredit you as a state. So how, how do you resolve that, that conundrum? It's a great, it's a great question, right? We saw early like examples of this. Uh, I remember there was a project called Damon Dow that was claiming to be purely anonymous and trying to explore this, um, you know, this this vector. I think there's always just meta questions just about um, how anonymous can you actually make things. So even with more advanced privacy preserving tools like Tornado Cash, we've seen that there's still holes that people can poke through to identify people. It's hard to kind of achieve that pure anonymity. I guess that raises a question as to whether or not, even though it's an interesting theoretical question in practice that will actually play out, you'll have some in completely impervious system with no, no way to de-anonymize things. But I think it's, it's an issue, right? Um, I think as more anonymizing technology gets deployed um, and as the coordination tools get better, um, it can be used for good or bad. Uh, you hope that people, and I tend to believe this, that people are generally good. Um, and if folks are per perpetuating something bad and they're identifiable, there's other tools to, to do that. Um, you know, but this is a risk that's been known for a while. We can go back to the Crypto Anarchist Manifesto that Timothy May put together, where he prophesized that you know, strong cri cryptography, uh, other forms of, uh, of systems, including things that, in my, my mind and my read, seem to intimate and, and kind of... Uh, prophesize blockchains, this was written in like the late 1980s, early 1990s, uh, are going to create a lot of regulatory challenges. Uh, but in my mind, uh, again, you can't go backwards, right? So you just have to deal with the, the issues as they, as they emerge. I will say that we didn't have this pervasive surveillance systems that we've been putting in place globally over the past 20 plus years before the 1990s, right? So uh, it, we were able to stop bad actors then. Uh, I'm assuming that we'd still be able to stop bad actors uh, in the future, even if our ability to track and trace things is, is not as, uh, as strong as, as it may be today. You word in the politician's ears. I think this is a great, great note to wrap up on. <laughs> Techno-optimistic uh, to the maximum. I love it. Fantastic. Um, Aaron, thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. We release new episodes every week. You can find and subscribe to the show on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, SoundCloud, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you have a Google Home or Alexa device, you can tell it to listen to the latest episode of the Epicenter podcast. Go to epicenter.tv slash subscribe for a full list of places where you can watch and listen. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for the newsletter so you get new episodes in your inbox as they're released. If you want to interact with us, guests, or other podcast listeners, you can follow us on Twitter. And please leave us a review on iTunes. It helps people find the show, and we're always happy to read them. So thanks so much, and we look forward to being back next week.